as we get ready to begin, I just want to uh, remind people, and I see some people have found uh, the refreshments from the school food service. It's out in the front area entrance and not in the uh, cafeteria. Uh, good evening. It is 7 o'clock, and we are here at Plymouth North High School. I'd like to welcome all of you to this second session of our Plymouth Annual Town Meeting. It's being held live on Monday, April 8th, 2019. We're at Overy Street Town Clerk Lawrence Pizer has advised me that we now have a quorum of at least 90 elected town meeting members, and I therefore declare that a quorum being present, the Plymouth Annual Town Meeting will come to order at 7 p.m. You may recall on Saturday that the assistant moderator, Nicole Manfredi, was struggling with her voice, and uh, she notified me today uh, that she is not well enough to be here. So we wish her well and a speedy recovery. Uh, and we also welcome once again former selectman and veteran assistant moderator, Brian Losey. And if there are no objections, I have appointed Brian Losey, and he, I understand he's already been sworn in by Town Clerk Larry Pizer. We also have, from the law firm of Copelman & Page, we welcome Greg Corbo as Town Council throughout this session. Greg, if you could just stand so people could recognize you. Thank you. We welcome him. And uh, once again, Kent Tavares is here as our Chair of the Board of Selectmen speaking on behalf of the Board. And we welcome Harry Salerno. Harry, do you have any opening remarks? Uh, no remarks tonight, no. <laughs> We have plenty to talk about already. <laughs> Why, thank you. He's here once again. And uh, our police officer on duty is Melissa Elliott. And for anyone who was not here on Saturday, there are materials at the sign-in table, including printed motions. I will tell you that there are a few changes from what you find in your book primarily related to roll call votes. We do not need a roll call and motion to amend. There are, however, some other articles, including a bylaw change and some financial articles where we do have a roll call, and I will let you know when that happens. So in addition to that, uh, we want to remind everybody that if you cannot be here, you notify the town clerk in writing. Anyone wishing to inquire as to why people are not here, you may notice from the votes on Saturday, we had a number of town meeting members who were not present. We also, under the charter required, to give notice in advance to the town clerk as to any articles giving rise to a financial conflict of interest. And I've gone through a number of the other um, procedures on Saturday, but at this time I would like to call upon uh, Assistant Town Water Brian Alosi, who will make a few comments about our electronic voting. Mr. Alosi. Okay, well I understand that on Saturday you had a, a preview of using your clicker but just as a review, um, I just wanted to show you that the bottom right button is the power button, goes on and off, and that when you vote, uh, the yes is number one, no is number two, and abstain is number three. And you have 20 seconds from the time that the green light comes on until it goes off. So you have, you have that uh, time certain of only uh, 20 seconds. Uh, during the electronic voting, this is important, um, I will be over at the left uh, side of the stage with the, the OTI technicians, Drew and, and Dan, to address any unrecorded votes. If your clicker is not working, you should bring it over to the, my right to uh, see Pearl, and she will either give you a new clicker or see what can be done. If it's anything that's extremely, uh, has a problem, uh, Dan will... <coughs> go over there and, and help uh, Pearl with, with your clicker. Um, and this is probably the most important thing. It is very important that if your vote is not recorded when the, the, the visual screen comes down, that you immediately stand and call a point of order and verbally notify the town moderator that your vote has not been counted or it might be wrong. It might be a negative instead of a positive. But, um, and then once you do that, then town clerk Larry Pizer will make the necessary corrections on his computer. That's about it. Thank you, Brian Losey, assistant town moderator. In addition, uh, we do have tellers this evening. Once again, Nancy Cadero 
Roxanne Whitbeck, Ann Dunn, and Jennifer Harris. Um, we will be recessing within two hours uh, from the start of the meeting. And I did want to bring up one additional matter. On Saturday, we had initially an electronic vote roll call, which read as a failed tie vote. And I just want to explain to town meeting that because a town meeting member got up and indicated that his vote was not recorded and that broke the tie, I didn't get into further discussion about tie votes. But a reminder that under our town charter, if there is a tie vote, then the moderator can choose whether or not to break the tie. So when I initially read the screen, it said that it failed, it didn't fail, it was a tie. And then it'll be up to me to decide whether or not I care to cast a vote. Uh, if I don't cast a vote, then it fails. If I do cast a vote, then my vote may determine a change from the tie. And I wanted to remind town meeting members about that. Um, are there any other matters to come before town meeting before we continue where we left off? If not, we will continue with the annual town meeting warrant, and we are going to go to Article 9 in our warrant, and we have motions from the Advisory and Finance Committee. First, under 9A, we've grouped them in A and B. You'll notice the A group is a majority, the B group is two-thirds. They are roll call. Mr. Salerno moves the town vote that the town appropriates a sum of $4,892,455 to pay costs of various capital projects listed as A1 through A29. You do have the text. The motion to amend that was listed in your packet has been withdrawn. However, I do have two new motions to amend, and when we come to those items, I will read those motions. Mr. Salerno. The comments that I have address both 9A and B. They are intertwined in your schedules. The only reason they're separated is it's a different quantum of vote. So I will begin in a unanimous vote of 12-0-0. The Advisory and Finance Committee recommends Tining approve Article 9A and 9B in full. The town manager recommends projects totaling $24 million $250,484, and the Advisory and Finance Committee agrees with that recommendation. Capital requests totaled $39,275,664 for fiscal year 20. The Advisory and Finance Committee refers town meeting members to pages 29 to 31 of your books for the CIC spreadsheet. Article 9 addresses 17 million $773,955 of those capital requests. This article um, is moved in two components, as some require a majority and others, those requiring borrowing, a two-thirds majority. The expenditures in this article are broken down into two broad categories, the general fund expenditures and enterprise fund expenditures. These broad categories don't track the voting, the voting is broken out simply by borrowing. The general fund projects listed on page 29 to 31, totaling $8,911,635, to be funded with $2,567,135 from free cash and $3,450,000 from borrowing. And $2,000,000. $894,500 from other available funds. Enterprise fund projects are listed on page 31. They total $8,862,320 to be funded with $354,796 from SUA Enterprise Fund retained earnings, $2,300,000 from SUA Enterprise Fund Borrowing, $1,593,112 from Water Enterprise Fund Retained Earnings, and $1,750,000 from Water Enterprise Fund Borrowing, and $230,412 from Solid Waste Enterprise Fund Retained Earnings. 
<coughs> 72,000 from airport enterprise fund retained earnings and 2,562,000 from airport enterprise fund other available funds grants. The balance of the recommended capital projects consists of annual town meeting article 11, road preservation for $5 million of borrowing, annual town meeting article 12, gravel road improvements of $1 million from the tax levy, and, and special town meeting article 9, playgrounds, $476,529 that was from CPA funds. That's it. Thank you, Harry Salerno. The two motions to amend that I have are actually to vote down the proposed items. Normally, I would suggest that town meeting member just speak in opposition. However, in going through Article 9A, we're not going to vote each individual item unless I have a motion. Rather, I will take each one up, see if there's any comments or discussion, and then we come to the two items being moved by Everett Malaguti, uh, A14 and A28, I will then take his motion. So if there are no further questions, I'm going to begin with A1, uh, and it is the fire station uh, roof replacement and sump pump. Any discussion on item A1? Michael Hanlon. Thank you. Whoops. <laughs> I'll use this one. Um, I wanted to address uh, item A1. Uh, the town is requesting $484,000 to replace the roof on fire station number one. Uh, my feeling is it shouldn't cost $484,000 to re replace a roof unless there has been significant underlying damage to the structure caused by a lack of proper roof maintenance. Uh, we probably could have replaced this roof for something less than $100,000, but because of the damage to the structure that somebody ignored, we now have to spend almost a half a million dollars to fix it. That should be unacceptable to all of us. The real question we should be asking is why did this roof get so bad that we have to spend a half a million dollars to fix it? Why did it get so bad? Why didn't we fix it earlier? Who is responsible for this situation, <coughs> which clearly needed attention but didn't get it? And how many other buildings are in a similar condition? And we're just waiting to get that number to fix them. I am not su suggesting at all that we should defeat this request. We need to approve this request. And it is clear that something needs to change. We need to put a greater focus on maintaining our building infrastructure going forward. I think everybody in this room knows that. So please, yes, vote yes. We have to fix this roof. Thank you. Further discussion on item A1. We're debating Article 9A from Plymouth's annual town meeting. And this is coming to you live on Monday evening from Plymouth North High School. Welcome. Mark Thomas Meslowski, Precinct 10. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask and to you to bring to your attention on page 41 under Burke's Law, item number one, fire station one, roof repair, $30,000 appropriation from April 2011. Expenditures, 10,700. Current Muni's budget, 19284. This was approved in 2011. It was not repaired. The, ent the entire amount of monies that we approved has not been spent. The bigger question here is why? If you go through Burke's Law, you will see that there's millions of dollars that we have approved that has not been spent. The question I have I believe first to Lynn on the Finance Committee is this. Under the free cash, is everything in Burke's Law considered free cash? Or what exactly, how is this classified? Through me, Mr. Maslowski. I'm sorry. And Lynn Barrett is the Director of Finance. She is not on the Finance Committee. I'm sorry, I beg Would your pardon. Would someone care to respond to his question? 
Lynn Barrett, Director of Finance, responding to a question from Mark Maslowski. Welcome, Lynn Barrett. Um, the items listed in the Burke's Law is our articles that have been approved by this um, body in previous years, and we show what, the, what has been expended to date and what the balance is. It is not part of free cash. Okay. Um, we just recently went through an audit of all of these items with the individual division heads and department heads who are responsible for these items, and most of them of the projects are going to be closed out at the end of this fiscal okay. year, so that money will return to the general fund and it will, it will get added to free cash. Um, but specifically, the items that are under the Building Maintenance Department of the Department of Public Works, the facility manager um, has reserved those because he's going to be using okay. specifically the ones for the fire station to um, add to the monies that we're asking for tonight to um, complete those repairs at the fire stations and, and the other ones he is um, scheduled to complete also. Some of them have been completed since we've prepared this report because okay. it's dated, um, I think, back March 8th. So a lot of the projects he's been working on are actually completed now. Too. I just wanted to clarify because I didn't understand whether any of those items were included in the uh, 2500000 of free cash or not. No. And is there, is there any mechanism that we have to put a sunset on these, that after five years you use it or you, you use it or lose it, that it automatically go, will go back. You just mentioned that you're not, we're now just doing this. Well, we do it every year. Okay. Um, we do it every year with the departments, and depending on who um, the vision head or department right. head that's responsible for them will report to us if they've been working on the project, they want to carry it over for the following year, or if the project's been complete, they'll close it out. So um, a lot of them that have been here since, you know, a few years old, they've said that they've, they're still working on okay. it. They're, you know, trying to get it completed. Um, one of the reasons why we started to do the Article 8 departmental equipment within the budget was because of this issue that some of the departments weren't addressing those items right away. So now that they're in the budgets, they actually have to finish okay. them within the fiscal year, and if they don't, it'll get closed out. So you won't see as many items on the um, Burke's forward. Law report going forward. Okay. Yeah, okay. So is, is there a time limit on it? Is it, is it a five year, is it a there six year? There is no time limit. Okay. Um, basically, Department of Revenue allows you to carry it over until the project has been complete, okay. or the project has been abandoned, or the project, um, you know, the, and, and basically that's what we do. I mean, after a while, if it's been sitting there for a long time, then we will just close it out. Okay. You know. Thank you. Yeah. Further discussion on item A1. If not, we'll continue to item A2, roof repairs at various town buildings. Any discussion? We are debating 9A. We're at item A2. Welcome. Hi, and this is Catherine Holmes, Precinct 8. Um, can someone from the town just speak to why uh, we allocated money in 2011? It was in the EDW uh, report that we had a roof problem at Station 1, and it was never repaired, and it's eight years later. Can someone from the town speak to that? Because I think Mike and the other gentleman made some really good points, and I think it's important to kind of clarify so that we don't have any misunderstandings. Thank you. So you're going back to item A1? Okay. We had moved on, but we'll be happy to have someone answer that question. I don't specifically remember in 2011 what happened with that project. Oftentimes, well, not often, although we see uh, we saw evidence of this earlier in this town meeting, we get bids early on in the process, like we'll start building the next budget this September. We'll start to gather bids so that we can submit our article, our, our department, our capital project requests We'll go through that process. By the time we get to town meeting, money becomes available July 1st. We get our specs ready to go. We go out to bid. There isn't enough in that line item. I believe in 2011, the amount that we requested initially was not adequate to cover the repairs that we needed to do. That's on item A1. Now again, going back to item A2. Any discussion? Item A3, hedge, exterior trim, and cupola repairs. Any discussion? Item A4, west, replace windows, one pod each year, phase two. 
Any discussion? A5 Highway. Replace 2006 wheel truck H32. Discussion? A6 Highway Replace 1999 six wheel truck H36. Any discussion? A7 Highway Replace 1997 loader. Any discussion? Next, A8, the implementation of EPA general permit stormwater. Discussion? A9, implementation of ADA compliance, phase one. Discussion? A10, water line and paving, Vine Hills, sections I and K, or L and K, I and K. Uh, discussion? A11, replace wooden ramps at Long Beach. Discussion? A12, Munis Capital Assets Software. Any discussion? A13, patrol rifle replacement. Discussion? A14, rehab engine three. Everett Malaguti moves to decrease the appropriation by 47,000 the amount appropriate under this item. Everett Malaguti on your motion. Everett Malaguti, Precinct 1. The rationale for the motion to amend this is because last year at Fall Town Meeting, we spent roughly $700,000 to buy a new engine to replace this engine, and the old engine was to be a backup in case anything happened. I think it's prudent to actually use the engine that we have now instead of fixing up an old one that may not even be used ever again and to save some of the taxpayer money. Thank you. Further discussion on the motion to amend? If not, I'm going to call for a vote. It's going to be a voice vote. All those in favor of the motion to amend to decrease this item, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Doesn't sound like everybody voted. So we're gonna <laughs> practice our first electronic vote this evening. This is on the motion to amend under A14, and it's to decrease Article 9A under A14 by the 47,400. You'll be voting when the green light goes on. It's a majority vote, and we're now waiting for the light to come on so that you can begin to cast your vote on this first motion at this session. You can now vote. Town meeting members are voting, and they have 20 seconds. We're down to 6-5. We have 135 town meeting members voting. Who are eligible to vote, 111 voted, 68 having voted in favor, 43 in opposition, zero abstentions. The motion carries. We will therefore decrease the main motion uh, by the 47,400. And as we scroll through the precincts, uh, please check to make sure that your vote was recorded properly. And if it was not, please rise with a point of order in order that we may uh, assure uh, that your vote is correctly tabulated. And we've seen all the precincts, so we're now going to continue with item A15, firefighting gear discussion. Hearing none, A16, public safety radio system upgrades discussion. Hearing none, A17, administration building demolition and beacon relocation discussion. A18, Relocate Taxiway Sierra. Discussion. A19, Replace 2003 Service Truck. Any discussion? A20, Replace 1997 Dump Truck. S58. Discussion. A21, Purchase New Pickup Truck. S51. Discussion. A22, replace a 2001 six-wheel dump truck. Discussion. A23, 
water infrastructure. Discussion? A24, water insertion valves in downtown area. Discussion? A25, replace 2005 W441 pickup truck. Discussion? A26, new pickup truck. Discussion? A27, trailer mount air compressor. Any discussion? A28, management transfer station management. Everett Malaguti moves to amend by decreasing 200,000 from the amount appropriated for solid A28. Mr. Malaguti, on your motion. So, Ever Malaguti again, um, the rationale for this motion to amend was back in 2014, um, we had the appropriation from two town meetings before in 2012 for a $200,000 expenditure for the realignment of the management transfer station to accommodate the, at the time, new curbside program for the town to have for curbside and transfer station. Since then, the numbers haven't fluctuated that much of actual transfer station um, pass holders in between that time frame, and I don't see within roughly a five-year time frame of last expending the money for that, that there's really any rationale for spending $200,000 again on there. I go down there constantly, roughly one, maybe two times a week to dispose of my recyclables and trash and I don't see really any deterioration for that area. Patricia McCarthy, um, Precinct uh, 5. I have a question of staff. Could they explain what the 200000 is going to be used for for maintenance? Thank you. Jonathan Beter is the Director, Department of Public Works. Welcome, Mr. Beter. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, everybody. So there's a couple of issues at the transfer station that we need to address. Uh, we have about 3,400 users. That has pre remained pretty uh, steady over the past couple of years. Um, first all is off is the, uh, the paving. Uh, again, the previous speaker said it's about five years old. We rehab that statement, realignment is the word we used. We just put the binder course of asphalt down. When you do parking lots or road construction, there's two layers of asphalt. There's a binder course, which is the thicker aggregate, which provides the structural base. And there's a top, the wearing course, which is the finish, the smaller course of asphalt. Uh, the finish was never applied to the transfer station. With the pavement being that old, what happens is the water starts to get into the pavement and will get underneath the stone and start to blow that up. So we really want to protect the investment there and, and overlay the asphalt and then stripe it accordingly. The other piece is when you drive through the into the transfer station on the left is the detention basin. That detention basin has never really stabilized, so we need to really come up with some uh, geotextile fabric and do some plantings in that basin to really hold the earth together. So that's what the request is for, the $200,000, and with that money you'll get a, a new uh, finished course of asphalt, some striping and some signage, and then the, the basin on the left will be stabilized. Thank you. And I ask that you support the article. Further discussion? If not, we'll call for a vote. First, a voice vote on the motion to amend from Everett Malaguti to reduce this item by the $200,000 being appropriated. All those in favor of the motion to amend say aye. aye. Opposed say no. no. Motion does not carry. Item 829, replace 2005 truck 820. Any discussion? Hearing none, we will now have a vote on the main motion as amended. You'll see that originally it was 4,892,455, and the new amount is Four million eight forty-five and fifty-five dollars. Any further discussion on Article Nine A? The amount from free cash is changing. Two million five nineteen seven thirty-five. The amount from free cash. Those are the changes now on the main motion, as amended by your earlier vote. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries unanimously. And we now move on to Article 9B. This will also be a two-thirds vote and a roll call on the uh, main motion. Mr. Salerno, any further comments on Article 9B? 
No, sir, not beyond what I've already spoken. We'll now begin with the items. Item B1, Plymouth Harbor dredging. Any comments? Item B2, Market Street bridge repair and rail painting. Any discussion? Item B3, culvert relocation on Hedge Road. Discussion? B4, collection system rehabilitation. Discussion? B5, Cordage Gravity Interceptor Relocation, Discussion, and B6, the Stafford Water Storage Tank Restoration, Discussion. Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. The motion carries. Will the noes please stand to be recognized? Everett Malagudi votes no. And behind you? Christine Pratt and John Sullivan and Frank O'Brien. John Sullivan and Mr. O'Brien. And that's it. And the motion passes. Article 10 is withdrawn. We now move to Article 11. Mr. Slerna moves the town appropriates the sum of $5 million to pay costs of improving various public and unaccepted roads and bridges. You have the text. This is a two-thirds vote, and although not written in your book, this will be a roll call if it is not unanimous. Mr. Slerno. In a unanimous vote of 8-0-0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 11. Town meeting approval of this article will accomplish the road maintenance and paving needs as determined by the DPW's current road program priority list. The article will once again fund 3.5 million for public roads and 1.5 million for unaccepted roads and will be utilized for and spent during the 2019 and 2020 construction season. This article will be funded by borrowing. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries unanimously. We now move to Article 12. Mr. Slerna moves the town appropriates the sum of $1 million for improvements to public and unaccepted gravel roads, including all costs incidental and related thereto from the fiscal year 2020 tax levy as authorized by Chapter 112 of the Acts of 2012 it's a majority vote, a roll call, if it is not unanimous, Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 8-0-0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 12. Town meeting approval of this article will facilitate improvements to gravel roads that are both public and unaccepted. Funding will be utilized for and spent during the 2019 and 2020 construction season for anticipated improvements to Chandler Street, Juniper Street, Milford Street, Roxy Cahoon, Cahoon, and Briggs Ave. The town's roads committee is very involved in determining which streets are affected. This article is funded from the general fund. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries unanimously. Article 13, Mr. Slerna moves the town vote to accept a sum of money that the state declares the available funds as the state's share of the cost of work on a general laws chapter 90. Said funds to be expended under the supervision of the town manager. This is a majority vote. Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 12-0-0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 13. Approval of this article will enable the town to accept state highway, the chapter 90 funds, for repairs and reconstruction of public roads. While the actual amount of Chapter 90 funds for fiscal year 2020 is not known at this time, Plymouth did receive more than 1.5 million for fiscal year 2019. The town expects a similar amount in fiscal year 2020, unless there is a change in policy or the state's financial health, but we won't know until late spring. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Article 14, 
This Salerno moves the town vote to transfer the sum of $661,958 from the town promotion fund created pursuant to Chapter 4 of the Acts of 1993 for programs and projects that enhance the beautification, recreational resources, public safety, promotional and marketing activities, events, services, and public improvements. A majority vote. Roll call if it's not unanimous. Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 12-0-0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 14. Approval of this article will allow expenditures from the town's promotion fund. The promotion fund, created by special legislation, is funded with 45% of the receipts from the hotel motel tax. The Visitor Service Services Board oversees expenditures from this fund. Expenditures include funding special events and celebrations. The Town Promotion Fund also is used to pay a marketing and promotions contract with Destination Plymouth, which provides the town with television and print advertising around the country, maintains a waterfront information booth, and provides access to a Destination Plymouth website. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries unanimously. Article 15 is withdrawn. That now brings us to Article 16. We'll begin with Article 16A. Mr. Salerno moves the town vote that the, moves that the vote taken under Article 16A of the 2014 Spring Annual Town Meeting for the restoration of the 1820 Courthouse as previously amended is hereby amended by reducing the now 2 million borrowing authorization approved thereunder by the sum of 500,000 and transferring the sum of money from the fiscal year 2020 Community Preservation Act annual revenues. A majority vote, a roll call if it's not unanimous, Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 10 0 0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 16A. Town meeting approval of this article will transfer $500,000 from Fiscal Year 2019 Community Preservation Act estimated annual revenues to reduce the amount of CPC 1820 courthouse debt from $2 million to $1.5 million. This year, as it was last year, the meals tax revenue has been coming in higher than expected. The finance director believes there is sufficient funding for the paydown of this debt over the next few years in combination with CPC funding. This falls within the scope of the meals tax and will preserve some community preservation funds for new purposes in future years. Further discussion on Article 16A. Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries unanimously. Next, Article 16B. Mr. Salerno moves the town appropriates the sum of $300,000 from the fiscal year 2020 Community Preservation Act annual revenues as a grant to the Plymouth Guild, Inc. It's a majority vote. A roll call if it's not unanimous. Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 10 0 0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 16B. Town meeting approval of this article will grant $300,000 to the Plymouth Guild, uh, DBA, a, the Plymouth Center for the Arts, for restoration and construction of a connector between Russell Library and the Lindens Building at the PCA, 11 North Street. The renovation will include the construction of an ADA-compliant elevator from the lower level to the second floor and create an entrance for, with expanded space for programming. The ADA access will expand the functionality of the Center for the Arts. William Cohane is the Chair of the Community Preservation Committee. Welcome. Thank you, Bill Cohane with the Community Preservation Committee. We're making a recommendation to the Community Preservation Committee to town meeting for $300,000 for the uh, alteration to the connector between the two historical resources there on North Street. In 2007, town meeting utilized CPA funds to buy the building and turn it over to the Center for the Arts and they have been managing the property since 2007. They have been able to raise over a million dollars to upgrade the building. The agreement we had with them that the town would retain the ownership of the land and the Center for the Arts would own the building. They were 
able to go out and do updates to that building, but now they're taking on a larger operation, trying to open up uh, the building in terms of its access to the lowest level, to the top floor, and also open up the green space in the back and make it more welcoming to the street front. They are here today. I'd like to introduce Peggy Page with the uh, Center for the Arts. She can walk you through on the organization's efforts to date relevant to the project. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Truffaletti and um, Bill Cohane. I'm happy to be here this evening to talk about Plymouth Center for the Arts because as a volunteer there and president of the board, it's kind of my home away from home. As many of you know, being volunteers yourself, which is really actually pretty pr impressive for a resident of the town to see how much volunteer hours go into the, the town government process. But I just wanted to assure you that Plymouth Center for the Arts is um, not just a place to hang art. We are involved in many, many uh, connections with people outside of our community that bring um, tourists and revenue into our town. Um, happen to be right up the street from the Plymouth Rock. And um, we get a lot of international um, visitors. Our guest book is signed by people in all different languages. Um, Chinese for one, um, and they wrote a comment, and the only way we knew they were really happy for the experience they have is because they had a smile sign afterwards, because we couldn't understand what they wrote. But we are partnering, we partner with everyone um, around the town, the town area. Um, our programs are diverse and um, very inclusive, and the thing that this elevator will do for us, it will allow not only those with obvious physical challenges, but many of us who are going through different stages of our life that need that elevator to, to get from one floor to the next. So we know that this elevator and this project, which we have tagged Elevate the Arts, is something that is very important for the town. The Arts Center is some place that has now become a destination for people in Plymouth. And um, we look forward to in inviting so many people here during 2020 and help them enjoy art and actually connect with our town and our history through the art that hangs on the wall. Our artists, it's all original art. We're open seven days a week, 50 weeks a year, free of charge. And um, Bill's giving me the, the cutoff sign. But I'm going to, um, I could talk on for a long time. But I'm going to introduce you to, um, yeah, all right. I could introduce, I'm going to introduce you to um, Richard Mulcahy. Many of you know him. He was our former president but he is now our treasurer, treasurer and keeps us all um, on budget, so. Oh, I'm sorry, it was Paul first. He's gonna talk about the project. So we hope to see all of you there over the next couple of months. We have lots of things going on, Congressional Youth Art Show, the Fine Art of Photography, and um, the ADA show, ADV show, which is a different vision show, which we partner with um, Perkins School for the Blind to have a show for that you, art you can touch this time. So we hope to see you all there, and thank you for listening to me and considering this article. Thank you. I'm uh, Paul Blanchard, uh, Precinct 13, Chairman of the Building Committee for the project. Um, the million dollars the bill referred to was actually monies raised through grants and donations uh, and activities over the last uh, eight or 10 years, which has already, for the most part, been put into the building with new roofing, uh, boilers, and other work. Um, we then embarked on a project in two phases. Uh, the first phase is now fully funded prior to this uh, article with the CPT. Uh, and that is to do the major, de the demolition, major construction work for the addition, including the foundations, a new sprinkler system to protect both buildings, uh, and uh, foundation and framing. It'll include uh, walls, windows, and roof of the uh, section in the center that's being built. Phase two is what we're here asking assistance with. Uh, that includes the actual ordering of the elevator equipment to go in the shaft that's being built in phase one uh, and finishes on the interior of the building, lighting and floor finishes and so forth to complete the work. So the overall project is approximately $1.7 million. We have uh, raised about a million dollars so far. There is additional funds coming in through our capital campaign and 
this article is very important to closing that gap and keeping the project on schedule for completion of phase two. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul Blanchard. Welcome, Richard Mulcahy, further speaking on Article 16B. Mr. Mulcahy. Thank you, Steve. Hi, I'm Richard Mulcahy. I'm the, cousin, the, the present treasurer of the organization. And I'm going to sort of re-emphasize a couple of points. First, the Plymouth Center for the Arts, the Plymouth Guild, is financially sound and successful. And I, I just don't want it to go unseen that before we started this project, that we did raise a million dollars and use that money to launch and to renovate the building. Now, this is a new project. We're looking for 1.7, as Paul just described. And we have raised 1.1 million, and we're trying to close the $600,000 gap. And we're involved in grant, um, grant writing, fundraising, and of course, visiting you tonight. So we appreciate your support. Further discussion, Article 16B. Mr. Cohen. Um, that concludes our presentation on 16B. Any further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. The motion carries. With the noes, please stand and be recognized. Everett Malagudi, and we have Mr. Stryer. Thank you. And in the back. Thank you, Joseph Tricelli. And the motion carries. We now move to Article 16C. Mr. Slerner moves the town appropriates the sum of $250,000 from the Community Preservation Open Space Reserve for open space and recreational purposes. This is a majority vote and a roll call if it's not unanimous. Mr. Salerno? In a, unan in, <laughs> in a vote of 9-1-0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 16C. Town meeting approval of this article will appropriate $250,000 from the Community Preservation Fund for the purchase of approximately 4.4 acres of land located off Newfield Street and Huntley Lane for open space and recreational purposes. This parcel abuts Jenny Pond and is part of the town brook water system. The preservation of the town's water resources is generally considered an important priority. There was some concern about the funding for the cost of the demolition of the building on the property. Thank you. William Cohan, Chair, Community Preservation Committee. Bill Cohan, Community Preservation Committee. This is Article 16C. You'll find it in the green handout under page 19. Um, if we can start the video, we can walk you through some related uh, locations. Here we are at the Summer Street Bridge at Town Brook. Uh, we're going to make our way up the Town Brook. I, I wanted to uh, relate this parcel to the importance of our town brook. Uh, eventually, we're going to uh, be viewing above where this parcel is located. It's a, crit a critical part of an overall strategy over the last 20 years that the Department of Marine and Environmental Affairs has been following, taking down dams along our town brook, finding the grant money to do that. The CPC has been working along the town brook all the way as far as uh, Black Cat Road with the headwaters of the town brook, uh, securing the uh, property, the Black Cat Preserve, a few years back. So we've been going along the Crawley Woods Preserve. There's been numerous land acquisitions, Plimco. These acquisitions had led to uh, a substantial uh, restoration of our town brook. The town of Plymouth is investing enormous amounts of energy and, and, and money in improving our waterfront in terms of our harbor as an as a economic viable resource to the town. Having clean water to that resource is incredibly important, and having the town brook back to a condition where it should be in terms of its uh, habitat for fish migration uh, and also for the, clean the cleanliness of the water. Right now, uh, the town, um, town is involved in a major restoration and removal of the Home Street Dam, which is very close to this property. This property is on Jenny Pond. Um, it is to our right. Uh, Jenny Pond is about 1,200 feet of frontage with the town of Plymouth controls. Uh, this would add to that frontage. Uh, this would control another 600 feet of frontage, allowing the town access around Jenny Pond uh, through uh, a series of properties that are owned by the town. Uh, there is one property uh, that you can see here. This is very interesting. If you look to the right, you can see uh, a vista that hasn't been seen in probably 350 years. That is a Town Brook location that's free of any obstructions or dams. So that's a unique view you 
saw there for the first time. Over here, we're turning towards Watson's Hill, uh, which is originally called Strawberry Hill. It was the first, it's a historical location controlled by the town. Uh, here is a closer look up of Watson's Hill. This location is where the native people signed the first peace treaty with the pilgrims that lasted nearly 50 years on this hill with Massasoit. Later on, Habermach was, uh, lived there for nearly 30 years with his, fam with his family. Uh, you can see from this location as we rise up, uh, we look back towards Jenny Pond. As we cross over, you can see straight ahead, just below Newfield House, the parsonage and a, and a path going in. That's the, that's the cart path, the driveway that takes you into Huntley Lane, the parcel that we're talking about, which is about 4.5 acres of land. Uh, you can see how that side of Jenny Pond is all wooded. This is the parcel that we're talking about. It was privately owned by a family, um, an individual uh, here in Plymouth, uh, worked with the committee to negotiate a price on the property. It appraised for $310,000. The family that controls the property and owns the property is willing to do a bargain sale with the town of Plymouth. They're selling the property to the town of Plymouth for $250,000. We want to thank the owner of the property working with us uh, and uh, creating a bargain sale opportunity with the town. Deb Balboni, a local businesswoman, was patient with the committee. It took a couple of years to get the agreement, but here on the site you can see there's a dilapidated structure, which we had C and C analytical look at. We have an environmental assessment of the building for $15,000 to remove any dangerous materials before demolition. Demolition would cost approximately $10,000. We have $25,000 estimated for its de de demolition. Um, I've been able to talk with the Office of Marine Environmental Affairs. They have the $25,000 for demolition. Um, and that concludes the uh, flyover of Jenny Pond, but we do think this is a, a great opportunity to add to all the work that's been going on on our town brook. That not only the last 25, 20 years that we've been working on this, you can go back to the tricentennial when they established Brewster Gardens and the original uh, parks along uh, town brook. This is a continuation of that now uh, during our 400th celebration. Thank you. Further discussion on 16C? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. The motion carries. Will the noes please stand to be recognized? Mr. Malagudi, Mr. Stryer, and the motion carries. 16D. Mr. Slurna moves the town vote to appropriate the sum of $160,000 from the Community Preservation Fund Fiscal Year 2020 estimated annual revenues for the creation, creation and or restoration and rehabilitation of land for open space and recreational use. Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 10 0, 0 the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 16D. Town meeting approval of this article will appropriate $160,000 from the Community Preservation Fund for a full design engineering plan and permits for a new surface area for Town Square. The intent is to create a public space that is historically sensitive as well as inviting for pedestrians to meet and greet as they walk through to get around town. The DPW will work with a broadly staffed committee throughout this process. Majority vote, roll call is not unanimous. William Cohen, Chair, Community Preservation Committee. Bill Cohen with the Community Preservation Committee. The committee is recommending $160,000 utilized from the recreational account of the CPA to create this uh, space on our, uh, um, actually we're gonna roll a video here to give you some indication and orientate you to the location. This is the foot of Water Street. Uh, turning back, we're looking at Leiden Street uh, Coles Hill and Leiden Street. Uh, this uh, allocation would set aside $160,000, not for another study. We've done numerous studies at this location over the last 30 years. There's been a lot of time and energy spent by different departments studying this location. This is for uh, engineered spec plans to design so we could go out to bid and actually improve the areas around our uh, Leiden Street and Town Square. The idea is that uh, that over a period of time, there have been different studies that have called for this work to be done. We have invested a great deal of CPA 
uh, funding in restoration of our town square, our 1749 courthouse, the new uh, National Pilgrim Memorial Meeting House. Uh, this restoration work is significant. Uh, adjacent to that, the First Church of the Pilgrimage has done a great deal of work on their facade, uh, and it is time to start to look at the surface area of the town square. The town square was once a very active uh, meeting place, an event space in the town of Plymouth. Uh, the, today we go there and light our Christmas tree, but in years past it was used as a meeting space and events. Uh, we think that by looking at the surface area, which was designed in the 1960s with a lot of tar and cement and modern day lighting uh, was uh, installed and over a period of time uh, we thought that it would be interesting to look at a, a plan that would incorporate sensitive historical materials to the location using at the town square, replacing a lot of the tar and cement with some other materials of introduction of cobble and brick in uh, uh, period lighting uh, and granite and bollards of that nature so that the town square could have uh, a, uh, an, uh, a look, something more than just kind of a sea of tar and cement. This would allow the space to be utilized for more than just the traffic that cars you see use, utilizing the site. Uh, it could be used for uh, events and other meeting locations. So our hope is to utilize this fund in a way uh, that would allow the town of Plymouth to begin the process of looking at uh, a plan um, that would allow the town to actually go ahead and move forward. Now the town has looked at, at different times, trying to find funding for this operation, but every time they presented it to the capital outlay, the Capital Oakley Committee felt it wasn't a priority. Uh, the Community Preservation Committee believes it's a priority and believes the town meeting should support the restoration of these surface areas to complement the historical nature of the first street laid out here in North America along with this town square as we approach 2020. If we do have a plan that is completed, the town will have the ability to pursue grants. Uh, the grants would be allow the town to find additional funding to actually implement the plan. But this is the first step in that direction by compiling the information that we would need uh, and meet with the different groups that are involved in this discussion. The Historical Commission, the Downtown Steering Committee, all interested parties uh, could weigh in on that discussion so the materials that we use in the design reflect the community's feelings regarding Town Square and Leiden Street. That completes my presentation on. Michael Babini. Thank you, Mr. Moira. Um, when Mr. Cohen presented this article to our caucus, um, and I, prior to the caucus, I had, in my own mind, raised the question about whether or not this actually applies under Chapter 61, uh, under chap the chapter relative to the CPA. Um, so after our meeting, I did ask him where it was, be, uh, what category it was being presented under. Uh, at the time, I noticed that in the actual uh, application to, town, uh, to the town that was not checked off. There are boxes in the application for uh, use. Uh, in this case, it's either open space, res uh, re open space recreational, historic, or housing. Mr. Cohen informed me that even though it's not checked off in the form, it's being submitted under open space recreation. So I went to the CPA legislation and I looked into open space recreation. Um, what I found was it really isn't related to hardscapes. Uh, it's really related to open space that's used in recreation type use. So I looked up into the actual community, community preservation coalition technical uh, and into the technical assistance article section of their uh, website. And here's some excerpts from that. Uh, in the summer of 2012, the Community Preservation Act was amended by the state legislation to allow broader uses for CPA, fu CPA funds on recreational projects. Those changes in the CPA allowed communities for the first time to rehabilitate their existing recreational lands and outdoor recreational facilities with CPA. Um, in the CPA statute under Massachusetts Laws 44B, the definition of recreational land in Section 2 is actually part of the definition of open space as follows. Open space shall include but not be limited to land to pr protect existing and future well fields, aquifers, recharge areas, watershed land, 
agricultural land, grasslands, fields, forest land, fresh and salt water marshes, other wetlands, ocean, river, stream, lake, and pond frontage, beaches, dunes, other coastal lands, uh, lands to protect scenic vistas, and land for wildlife and nature preserves, and land for recreational use. And then it went on to say recreational use is further defined as follows. Recreational use active or passive recreation use, including but not limited to the use of land, community gardens, trails, and non-commercial youth and adult sports, and the use of land as a park, playground, or athletic field. Because of the specific language included in the above description, it is clear that CPA is designed to fund recreational activities that take place in outdoor, open, and more natural settings, such as parks, playgrounds, and athletic fields, as well as community gardens, hiking and biking trails, and the like. As the Department of Revenue puts, uh, puts it, the CPA is intended to promote outdoor recreational pursuits which take place on open land in a relatively natural setting. Town Square is not open land in a, naturally, uh, in a natural setting, relatively natural setting. Other recreational structures, so that you may ask yourself, are all structures on recreational land prohibited under CPA? Not necessarily. Open space, area structures, and parks like amenities such as pergolas, bandstands, pagodas, walkways, monuments, playgrounds, equipment posts, and the like are definitely in keeping with CPA, so long as those activities take place on land dedicated to recreation. This land is not dedicated to recreation. Uh, so my feeling is that this does not comply under the section of the CPA land, uh, 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 Act. I further checked in and found a court decision, a recent court decision, between the town of Norwell and uh, citizens that filed suit against the town for an uh, appropriation to build a sidewalk in the downtown that would connect parks and recreational areas um, 30 seconds. within the center. Uh, the court found against the town and said that this is, did not apply to the CPA uh, fund. So they could not use that money to fund sidewalks. One of the proposals under this particular, one of the pieces under this particular proposal is to fund sidewalks, hardscape, road pavement. It's not permitted under chapter, under this chapter. Um, so I would ask that you not approve this. Thank you, Mr. Bini. Um, as it is not permitted. Thank you very much. Christopher Hull, Precinct 14. Please speak, Mr. Hull. Oh. Uh, just a question. Uh, yes, Christopher Hull, Precinct 14. Just a question for Mr. Cohen. Um, could you speak to how this um, may or may not be done in conjunction with some of the other uh, articles that we voted on at this town meeting, specifically in relation to the um, MS4 and stormwater uh, initiatives that we've approved. Um, is this work being done in concert with, the, with some of uh, the work that the DPW is doing in that nature? Or is this an in independent uh, this, initiative? This would be independent uh, to the uh, earlier discussions on uh, that department. This is a, a separate initiative. And again, uh, in terms of the ruling in Hanover, we were talking about constructing a sidewalk. We're not, we're not advocating the construction of a sidewalk. We're putting money aside for a plan to be devised to introduce historically sensitive materials to the location. And as you can see, this place has served as a public space, a public meeting space. And at different times, the town has had events. We have a very unique situation in our downtown. We have a town square that's been there for 400 years. It turned into kind of a, a bad traffic cul-de-sac in the, the late 1960s. We're advocating that the surface area introduce historical materials so that the community has greater recreational use of this at different points in times and celebrations and activities. It's a very historic location. It's turned in kind of a traffic-y parking situation that only happened in recent years, in the last couple of generations. So we're advocating that it go back to be that public park open, open space, but obviously respect the fact that cars are operating in the 21st century and they need to get through the square and at different times they'll be moving around for uh, safety and fire apparatuses and turning radiuses will all be respected. But at different times, we'd like to see this space be utilized for those events and have materials that reflect the experience when you come to Plymouth, you come to a waterfront and you're drawn up Leiden Street, you're drawn up to this space. 
So uh, we have had a chance to talk to uh, a council and it is fundable under the Community Preservation Act. Anything that we do uh, does have to be uh, reviewed by that process. So we're protected in that, that instance. Just one quick follow up if I may. Um, will the DPW be involved at all in the decision making process for the materials and, and um, design? So it would be the Department of Public Works. I'd leave that to the town manager to decide what department she wants to handle uh, such a uh, project. Uh, but JB has been intimately involved in this project and decide trying to find an opportunity to introduce these materials over a period of time. We call that when they do prepare uh, this discussion that the Historical Commission is involved and invited to those discussions, that uh, stakeholders in the community are also invited to that, that uh, Downtown Steering Committee, that the precinct town meeting members from this location are invited to a discussion, but there'd be community outreach to get people's input about uh, how we introduce materials and how they would operate. We have to deal with the reality that it is a public way and there are buildings abutting it and people are coming and going and we have to deal with the maintenance issues over a period of time. Uh, we're calling for an introduction of these materials uh, at the location. Any further questions, Mr. Hu? Thank you, Samuel Butterfield, followed by Rita Simpson. We're debating Article 16D, Mr. Butterfield. Sam Butterfield, Precinct 4, I think. Yes, the last time I checked. Sometimes I gotta... I agree that Mr. Babini may have a point with respect to the open space or recreation designation, but certainly this has a historic significance that I would say far uh, surpasses any recreational benefit. Why uh, can't this be considered under the historic designation rather than the recreation? The, the language includes Mr. both. Cohen. Excuse me? The language includes both historical recreational uh, right. utilization of funds. We put that in the article for that purpose because okay. it is a historical surface area, but the materials that we're bringing in is not restoration. Uh, we're, we're building something, but we're not rehabilitating or restoration of these materials. The materials that we're introducing are historically sensitive to the location. So we do have a historical longitude and latitude. We're trying to improve the surface materials that uh, complement the historical buildings around it by introducing those materials. Right, okay. I just wanted to be clear that Mr. Bubini's objection is not going to, uh, does not mean that if you want to vote against that, uh, the article, it's not, it shouldn't be based on just that designation because it does still qualify under an historic district or historic definition. That's why we included both. Right. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Butterfield, it's not only in the warrant, but it's in the motion, the language. Uh, Rita Simpson, please come forward. Rita Simpson, Precinct 10. I just have a question. The $160,000 that we're asking to appropriate is just for the study. How will if the, how will this be paid for? Anyone care to respond to a question from Rita Simpson as to how we would pay for this not the study, study, but if it's approved? I mean, who's going to pay for the what would it cost? A million William dollars Cohen, or something? Um, Chair, we have an estimate that to uh, an estimate that would be a couple of million dollars to actually implement the plan. We're not calling for that now, but uh, what we're trying to do is provide the funding to get to a point where you have total engineered spec plans so that you could take it out to a cost estimator and find out exactly what it would cost to implement the plan. At the same time, with something like that, you'd be eligible for a self-help grant or some other park grants to help you uh, apply for funding to help pay for something like this. There's different grants that would uh, be uh, sought after at that time. I don't think we would come back to town meeting without uh, some success on the grant writing front to help implement this program. But that's a, that's a discussion at a later date. Right now we're trying to get to a point where we have something that to work with. Um, I do have counsel here that can comment on the legality of what Mr. Babini has spoken and what I've spoken to. Could I finish my questions? Oh yes, Rita Simpson. sorry, thank you. Please sorry. continue. Uh, you talk the about the hardscape and how things have changed, but changing the hardscape is not going to change the traffic in that area. We have gone beyond, you know, 400 years ago, or even 200 years ago, or even 100 years ago, 
and the traffic's not going to change. We've got busy intersections, we've got traffic, and even in looking at your current pictures, they look good compared, no, not the old ones, the new ones, they look good compared to what Burial Hill looks like. And if I was going to spend any more CPC funds for the historic preservation of the town, based on what we heard at Saturday's meeting, I think it should go to Burial Hill and repairing that, because that is a piece of our history. Nice. And I, I just don't think changing the hardscape is going to change the traffic. I don't think it looks that bad. But I certainly think if we were going to spend more CPC funds, $165,000 for a study would repair how many more stones in that burial hill? Because there's about $140,000 left of CPA, CPC funds from the last go around. And if we could have that 160 some thousand dollars to work on Burial Hill, we would do a lot more for the historical significance of this town. And I agree Richard, with you. Well, I don't know the I, question. Well, Excuse I, me, Mr. Corum. Did you have a question for him? Or was that a comment? I, that and I want to know what it would cost. You, you spend $165,000 for a study. Who's going to pay for what the study produces? Us coming to town meeting and approving $2 million? from the town budgets or from DPW or s someone to fix this? Uh, we're not proposing that now. And if we were ever come back to town meeting to implement this, it would be as a combination of successful grant writing to actually implement it. But the CPC has committed nearly a half a million dollars, over half a million dollars on Burial Hill in the stone restoration. We believe that Burial Hill is an important component to our town square. It is the entrance to Burial Hill. So as people come into our town square and make their way up to Burial Hill, they're experiencing this in association with that historical resource. We feel that <laughs> This work on Leiden Street and Burial in Town Square complement Burial Hill and the experience of going into it from that location. Not if you go into it and the Burial Hill doesn't look good. Thank you. Richard Neely. We're debating Article 16D. Mr. Neely. Yes, Richard Neely, Precinct 15. You will all remember this area where we voted several hundred thousand dollars for the courthouse where we voted $2.6 million for the church. Now we're saying the road is a historic shrine. I respectfully disagree. Michael Bavini, we're debating Article 16D. Uh, Bill said that the, it would qualify under historical. I believe it's clear that it doesn't qualify under historical. It doesn't meet the guidelines for historical preservation. Is that correct, Bill? Well, we have included both recreational and historic. That's not my question. And I have counsel here to comment to that. Fine. I, I believe the question yeah. earlier was, and Mr. Cohen responded that it was within the warrant language as to historic. And I would, again, I would just tell you that the motion before you is to appropriate the money, and it says for the rehabilitation of land for open space and for historic preservation. So I, both I aspects of the act neither one are included in the motion. Neither one, I don't believe, Mr. Moore. Thank you. Matthew Tavares, we're debating Article 16. Matthew 16D. Tavares, Precinct 4. Um, in respect to uh, Mr. Bernini's comments on the historical or recreational, and it was a very long definition of recreational, but I guess my question would be to, and it perhaps I don't know if it's Mr. Kahane or, or if, it's, if it's someone else from the town. When we do, uh, we have moved the town, uh, I guess it's called the community tree now, the Christmas tree, down to the town uh, square there. Uh, wouldn't that be considered a recreational uh, gathering of uh, residents, which is attended by thousands as I, I last saw it? I think, uh, Mr. Cohen, to responding. Answer that, into the, into, to, to answer that, I'd like to uh, allow uh, town council to respond to some of the questions associated with it. Yes. We have town council with us this evening. Further responding on the statutory interpretation, this is Greg Corbo, Coleman and Page. Welcome, Mr. Corbo. Thank you, through you, Mr. Moderator. Um, so, you know, there are three categories of um, expenditures under the Community Preservation Act. There's recreation, open space, and historical preservation. And, you know, where a particular project fits within those categories is a very fact-specific inquiry. And just because a court 
may have issued a ruling as to putting in sidewalks in one town doesn't necessarily mean that a court would rule the same way with respect to this particular project. Based on the information you're seeing here, this project is to both promote recreation, open space, and historical preservation. What, it, what is being proposed here is a, pro, is a project to restore an area back to a passive recreational use, which is a type of use that is recognized as being appropriate under the Community Preservation Act. So in my opinion, based on what's being described here, this project would qualify for an expenditure of CPA funds. Everett Malagudi. Everett Malagudi, Precinct 1. Surprisingly, I actually am voting in favor of this article tonight. <laughs> Uh, the, the rationale for it is because it has been a long neglected site in the town that really needs some revitalization. If we were spending the money to actually do the restoration today for sidewalks and everything, I'd be voting it down based on the question of a legal issue for the hard surface. But since it's a design, I don't think that that actually um, qualifies in this argument as of today. Thank you. David Peck, Article 16D. Uh, just a question for uh, David Peck, Precinct 4. Uh, a clarification from Mr. Cohen and the CPC. The backup material says the design for the hardscape would be $100,000 to $125,000 with an additional $35,000 for a water feature. Uh, I'm, you know, I remain to be convinced whether we need a water feature or not, but should we not, um, how would the full 160 be used rather than the 125 the backup material is requesting? Mr. Gohan responding. Um, we are not proposing a water feature in Town Square. Uh, we were compiling some information that had been compiled by the Department of Public Works. Uh, there's a study that we included that showed a water feature. There was some estimating done around the water feature. We're not proposing that. We expanded the amount to cover $160,000, not only Town Square, but the surface area leading down Leiden Street uh, to Water Street. So that's where we uh, use the estimates to come to 160. But we're not promoting a water feature. I don't think it's really a location that uh, ever had such a feature. Um, but we do leave those decisions up to the community about the surface area materials and the design and look of that through public discussions and meetings. Kenneth Howe. Kenneth Howe, Precinct 11. I move the question. It's a motion to close debate. It is not debatable. We see any other people that wish to be heard. And we'll now take a voice vote on whether to close debate on Article 16D. All those in favor of closing debate say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. Motion carries by two thirds. We've now closed debate. We will now have a vote. We'll first take a voice vote since it's a majority vote. All those in favor of Article 16D say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. We'll do, it passes but we'll do an electronic voting in order to have the roll call. So get ready with your remotes. When the green light goes on, we will take a vote on Article 16D. Please uh, check when the light goes on. You'll have 20 seconds. We have 135 elected town meeting members, and the light is on, and we're gonna show the seconds on the screen for town meeting members to be voting on Article 16D. And even though the seconds are not showing, the green light is showing, and you'll have to figure it out as to whether you still have time. Uh, 135 elected members, I see over 100 have voted. Uh, as we count down for the time, uh, we're showing 106 have voted. And when the light goes off, we'll conclude the voting, and then we'll have a display of how town meeting members have voted. And we're now showing the time, but the light is off. We have 108 who did vote, and we can now display the precincts and as to how they voted. It did pass, and you'll see 72 in favor, 36 in opposition, zero abstentions. The motion carries. We're now showing precincts one, two, and three. The green is a yes, the red is a no, and abstentions would be a yellow, but there were no abstentions. We're gonna continue to scroll through the precincts, we're going to leave precincts one, two, and three and move on to the other precincts so that we can then move on to the next article. 
Uh, this is town meeting coming to you live on Monday, April 8th from Plymouth North High School. We are on Overy Street. Mr. Withington, do you have a point of order while we're scrolling? Point of order before you thank everybody in the room. I'm sure you're going to have that chance. But I believe we're paying a significant amount of taxpayer dollars for the service for a voting electronically. And I don't mean to rain on anybody's parade, but I believe it undercuts the importance of voting if the equipment is not working. And if I were the vendor of this particular electronic voting machine, I would be embarrassed at the first showing, and I would make sure that I took care that the machinery worked out well. And I understand electronics have glitches, but I do find it uh, testing to be the best word that I can express. So I'd like to express my displeasure in that the material that is being displayed, the light doesn't go on, the seconds don't go on. And I realize that's nobody's problem, but I do think it upsets me and I would be remiss not to speak that I don't think we're getting the value that we're putting into this investment. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Withington. And I would just respond by saying that on Saturday during the break, in the morning, we did have conversations uh, with the vendor, and I believe there have been conversations since Saturday. We're not going to take any more time on this, Mr. Withington. Your point has been made. I will say, however, that unless the integrity of the vote is compromised, we're going to continue. And even in that last vote, you did get 20 seconds. The green light was on. Yes, we didn't see the 20-second readout, which is a belt and suspenders additional feature, and it is some delay in seeing the readout. We're down now to precincts 10, 11, and 12, but we're going to be patient and we're going to go through the electronic voting. Your point is noted. Any Thank further you. discussion? If not, we're going to be continuing once we have the readout, um, and you do have it there, precincts 13, 14, and 15. Uh, point of order, yes. Uh, Thank you. And it didn't come through. So. Linda McCall of Precinct 14, her vote was a yes, and it did not show. So we now have 73 yeses. Point of order. Point of order, please stand, yes. Uh, my vote is yes, And your name? Win. Hi, Win. Yes. Uh, and yours was a yes? Yes. yes. Okay. 74 to 36. Thank you. Again, if you have questions with your clicker, uh, please check with uh, Pearl Sears. Remember to clear them. And uh, we'll continue with the next article, which is 16E. Mr. Salerno moves the town vote to appropriate the sum of $2,172,443 from the fiscal year 2020 estimated annual revenues of the Community Preservation Fund. Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 10-0-0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 16E. Town meeting approval of this article will allow the Community Preservation Committee to allocate for future spending 10% of the estimated annual revenues of the Community Preservation Fund, 313,244 for each of the following, open space, historic resources, and community housing. <coughs> Pardon me. Also, $125,298, 4 percent of the estimated annual revenues of the CPA will be set aside for funding administrative and operational expenses and $60,000 for interest on debt. The balance of the annual CPA revenue will be held as a reserve balance, which can be used for any CPA purpose at future town meetings. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. no. Motion carries. Will the no please stand to be recognized? John Sullivan. Thank you. We'll now continue with Article 17. Mr. Salerno moves the town vote to accept the provisions of general laws, Chapter 59. Section 5, Clause 54th, to allow the town to establish a minimum value not, less, not in excess of $10,000 for personal property assessments and further to establish such value. It's a majority. It is not a roll call, Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 800, 
The Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 17. Town meeting approval will formalize this long-standing long practice. Dale Weber. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dale Weber, Precinct 3. Could I get clarification, please, on the language of this article as to if it establishes a $10,000 minimum criteria for all businesses and properties that have personal property or that if the value of that personal property is less than 10,000, there will be no tax. Anyone care to respond to a question from Dale Weber? Ann Dunn, she is the Director of Assessing and she is here to respond on Article 17. Welcome, Ann Dunn. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Into the, mic. the recommendation that I have currently is for a $1,000 minimum. You could have $10,000. I need to grow. <laughs> I'm recommending $1,000. It's been a practice within the assessing office to not assess anything below that due to the cost to the town. We used to send out four bills. They were maybe a dollar, two dollars. So it gets a little costly and the amount to collect will add up. So we're recommending $1,000. You also have the option to do up to 10,000. So anything below 10,000 would be exempt. For the discussion, Christopher Hu. Yes, uh, thank you for that explanation. But I just want to cite the memo that it's included in our book on page 215. And it says, Clause 54 of Section 5 of Chapter 59 allows the legislative body to establish a minimum value for personal property subject to taxation, but not in excess of $10,000 of value. It has been a long-standing practice to use $1,000 as the minimum. So my read of that is that you will be increasing the taxation from anywhere between $1,000 and $10,000 per the language that's included in the memo. Could you please uh, either, one, clarify that, or two, if, if we're actually voting on the memo, I would encourage the voters to not approve this and wait for a uh, revised um, memo that meets what you just said up here at the microphone. So yeah, that done. statute allows you to go up to below 10,000. You cannot go beyond 10,000 as an exemption. The practice we have used is a thousand dollar minimum for the personal property to be taxed. So you cannot go in excess of the $10,000 taxation. It has to be below that. My recommendation is a thousand dollars. For the, for the comments, Mr. Hu. Yes, I mean, on Article 17 in the, the motion packet that we have, that number also cites um, uh, not in excess of $10,000. So my, the way I read this is that there's no certainty as to what we'd actually be taxed on between that $1,000 and $10,000. So I would encourage this, uh, all the town meeting representatives to vote no on this and wait for a more formalized proposal at a future town meeting that more explicitly states the specific taxation rates because this is extremely uncertain between $1,000 and $10,000 per the language that's included in this book. Mr. Hull, would you uh, care to make a motion to amend to change that from $10,000 to $1,000? No, I do not. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. It's a majority vote. I'll first do a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Opposed say no. No. Chair is in doubt. We will do it by roll call. Please get ready to vote electronically. When the light goes on, you'll be voting on Article 17 as printed in your motion book. And when the light goes on, you have 20 seconds in which to vote. And the light is on. The seconds are on. You'll see the seconds counting down. We're voting on Article 17. We have 135 elected town meeting members. On the bottom of the screen, we're showing the number of members who have voted. I see that there are some members not seated, but we're doing the voting, and we're down, and we've completed, and we have 111 of 135 voted. It failed. 46 voting in favor, 64 in opposition, one abstention. You'll see the screen. We're at precincts 4, 5, and 6 as we scroll through 7, 8, and 9. We are watching on Article 17 to make sure that all votes have been recorded and that they've been recorded properly. And we finish with 13, 14, and 15. 
Those are the displays of the votes for the article, and we now move on to Article 18. We have a motion from Mr. Salerno. Town vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to petition the General Court for special legislation it has to do with the appointment of a duly licensed physician. Mr. Salerno. In a vote of 840, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 18. Town meeting approval of this article will amend Section 7, Board of Health 3-7-1 to add, one of the members shall be a duly licensed physician provided that such person is reasonably available for appointment to carry out the duties of the position. The Advisory and Finance Committee feels that, when reasonably possible, the addition of a physician to the Board of Health would be an asset for the town. Those voting against generally felt that this rule properly belonged in the town's bylaws. Since it is not a state requirement, it did not seem reasonable to shackle the committee with a charter rule that cannot be easily undone or temporarily overruled. Brigitte Keene, Chair, Plymouth Board of Health, welcome. We're debating Article 18. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening. Article 18 is about a physician as a standing member of the Board of Health. Article 18 is not about charter versus bylaw, as you may read in the minority position. Through charter committee consultation, and because the composition of the Board of Health is in the Charter, the amendment belongs in the Charter. Please let me be totally open here. You listened to Senator, Senator DiMacito speak Saturday about the opioid addiction problem in Plymouth, and Dr. Sorensen speak about the 9,000 school nurse visits per month, some of them serious. The Wednesday and Saturday Old Colony Memorial front page stories were about active measles from a tourist visiting our town. It's not my intent to fear monger, but to be clear, measles, if not acted upon quickly by your health department, can be deadly. You may not know that the school nurses, by state law, report to the public health department. Article 18 is about the ability of the Board of Health to quickly address the health needs of this growing community, a community actively attracting tourists as its revenue model. Soon hundreds of thousands of tourists, hopefully, will arrive from all over the world during the 400 celebration. Healthcare is complex, but this concept is not. A physician's full prescriptive authority does not reside in any other health care provider that could be appointed to the board. In many cases, the board and department are working with the state Department of Public Health, which is led by a group of physicians. A peer-to-peer, physician-to-physician interaction allows the Plymouth Health Department and the board to move quickly to resolve crises. The Department of Public Health and the Board of Health agree on the need for a physician as a standing member on the Board of Health. This is a forward-thinking request as your town grows. I am requesting that you also agree. Please vote yes on Article 18. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. no. The motion carries. And we will do it by electronic voting to have the roll call. I think there are enough no's. So please get ready to vote electronically. And when the light goes on, we'll be voting on Article 18. And the light is on. The seconds are ticking down. And we have 135 elected town meeting members. We are in our second session of our annual town meeting. It's coming to you live on Monday, April 8th. Town meeting is in the second session. We are voting on Article 18. We are counting down the seconds. We've completed and we have 109 100 of 135, 88 voting in favor, 21 in opposition. It passes. We have zero abstentions. You'll see that we're scrolling through the precincts so that town meeting members can be assured that their vote was recorded correctly. We're now at precincts 10, 11, and 12. We do have 15 precincts in Plymouth, 
And that completes Article 18. Article 19, Mr. Salerno moves the town will vote to amend general bylaws chapter 120 noise as provided below. You have the text. It's a majority and a roll call. Mr. Salerno. In a vote of 10 to 0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 19. Town meeting approval of this article will amend Chapter 120, Noise, of the General Bylaws. The change allows activities of town, county, state, or federal agencies between the hours of 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. as requested by the Department of Public Works. Those, expo those opposed express concern about early morning noise. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The motion carries. We'll now have another roll call vote. Get ready to be voting roll call on Article 19. When the light goes on, you'll begin voting. You'll have 20 seconds in which to vote. You now can vote. We have the 20 seconds being counted down for the 135 town meeting members. This is the majority vote. It did pass, but we are now doing a roll call since it was not unanimous. We're down to seven seconds. We have over 110. We have 110 town meeting members who have voted this time, and it is shown 111. It passes. We have the vote, 90 in favor, 21 in opposition, zero abstentions. We're now scrolling through the precincts. We're at four, five, and six. We're going to scroll through all 15, seven, eight, and nine, and we're giving town meeting members an opportunity to record, make sure their record is correct. 10, 11, and 12, and finally 13, 14, and 15. And we now move on to the next article, which is Article 20. Mr. Salerno moves the town vote to accept and allow, and you'll see the streets here. Um, it's a majority vote, Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 8-0-0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 20. Town meeting approval of this article will accept the 21 roads listed in the warrant language as public ways. These roads have been reviewed and approved by the Roads Advisory Committee for acceptance and layout establishment. Discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Article 21. Mr. Salerno moves the town vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to acquire by gift, purchase, eminent domain, or otherwise 4,657 plus or minus square foot parcel of land. It's a majority vote, Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 8-0-0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 21. Town meeting approval of this article will accept the gift of land on River Street known as Cemetery Road, securing continued access to the Chiltonville Cemetery from River Street. It's a majority vote. Any discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Article 22. Mr. Slerna moves the town vote to amend the zoning bylaw, section 207.11, in accordance with the final report of the planning board on the proposed amendment to the zoning bylaw. It's a two thirds vote. A roll call, if not unanimous, Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 800, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 22 with the amended language as follows. Up to 22 acres in size be allowed on landfills, in place thereof, up to, in place thereof of up to 15 acres in size be allowed on landfills. The committee felt unanimously that town meeting approval of this amended zoning bylaw language would maximize the use of the town's landfills for ground mounted solar voltaic systems and the opportunity to generate additional income. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries unanimously. Article 23, Mr. Salerno moves the town vote to amend its zoning bylaw to correct typographical errors and omissions. Two thirds vote, roll call if it's not unanimous. Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 12-0-0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 23. Approval of this article will amend the zoning bylaw to correct typographical errors and omissions to the bylaw so that the current bylaw reads as intended. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Apple say no. Motion carries unanimously. Article 24, Mr. Salerno moves town vote to revise the aquifer protection, di protection district boundaries on the town's official zoning map. It's two thirds vote. Roll call if it's not unanimous. Mr. Salerno. In a unanimous vote of 1200, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 24. Approval of this article revises the town's official zoning map to add the Red Brook Developments Zone 2 to the town's aquifer protection district as required by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection wellhead protection process. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries unanimously. We now move to Article 25. Mr. Slerna moves the town vote to transfer the care, custody, management, and control of the parcels listed on Table 1. And you have the text for that. It's a two-thirds vote. Mr. Slerno. In a vote of 930, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 25. The majority of the committee supported taking the properties out of tax title and putting them into conservation to aid the creation of the Long Duck Groundwater Resource Area as recommended by the Planning Board. Those voting against generally felt that there was no need to put these parcels into Water Commissioner control at this time. There is no rush and a more comprehensive plan may be in order. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. As opposed? No. Motion carries by more than two-thirds. And we will now move to Article 26. Mr. Slerna moves the town vote to transfer the care, custody, management, and control of the parcels listed on Table 2 and 3. It's a two-thirds vote. Mr. Salerno. In a vote of 11-1-0, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends town meeting approve Article 26. The majority of the committee supported taking the properties out of tax title and transferring them to the Water Commissioner for the dual purpose of providing aquifer protection through the creation of the Long Duck Groundwater Resource Area and protecting a potential future well site as recommended by the Planning Board. Further discussion? Hearing none. Call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. This motion carries unanimously. And we now move on to Article 27. Article 27 has been withdrawn. Article 28, I have no motion. Hearing no motion, I declare no action. This town meeting is in recess for 15 minutes. There are refreshments at the front of the building. Recess is at 8.42, and we will return at 8.57. I'd like to invite town meeting members to now take your seat. We are resuming the, from the recess and we are going to continue. I've received several procedural motions during the break. Uh, two motions to reconsider. The first motion was a request to reconsider Article 7 in the special town meeting. I denied that request. Again, a reminder for town meeting members, once the special or the annual, uh, once they have dissolved, you can no longer reconsider. Our special town meeting dissolved on Saturday, and therefore, that ship has sailed. And we can, however, move to reconsider Article 17. John Hammond moves to reconsider Article 17. Mr. Hammond, did you vote on the prevailing side? I did. Thank you. And would you like to speak as to the reason for your motion to reconsider? I believe we've fallen into the department of utter confusion and that I think what we did was to vote against allowing any exemption from the personal property tax. Um, so I think we should re renew the, re redo the motion. Anyone else care to be heard on the motion to reconsider? Mr. Moderator? Uh, Mr. Salerno, would you care to be heard on the motion? We're not going to argue Article 17. We're just arguing as to whether to reconsider. Harry Salerno, 
from the chair of the Advisory and Finance Committee. Um, all I want to say is there was considerable confusion, and I agree with Mr. Hammond's motion. Um, I, I, th I think that the article itself was um, poorly written and poorly explained, but it serves a fairly a, a basic housekeeping purpose and a, and a necessary one. And I'll speak to the article when we get to it. If Further discussion on whether to reconsider, Mr. Delafield, do you want to speak on the issue of whether to reconsider? Yes, I believe that the reason for reconsidering this is that the, uh, as written, it did not state what it was supposed to state and that we should reconsider for that reason. Any further discussion on whether to reconsider? If not, I will call for a vote. It will be a voice vote. It can be a majority vote. I will now call for a voice vote on whether to reconsider Article 17. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. no. Motion carries. We will now reconsider Article 17. Do we have seven members who question the vote? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven question the vote. We'll now vote electronically. Get ready to vote on the motion to reconsider. This is a majority vote. And when the light goes on, you'll be voting as to whether to reconsider Article 17. And when the light goes on, You'll have the opportunity, it's a procedural motion. It's a motion to reconsider an article. Please vote. You have 20 seconds as to whether you want to reconsider. We have 135 elected town meeting members. Town meeting members are now acting on a procedural motion to reconsider. It's to reconsider Article 17. We have five seconds in which to vote. Town meeting members are completing the voting. 105 town meeting members have voted on this Procedural motion, 70 voting in favor, 36 in opposition, zero abstentions. The motion carries. You can look at the screen, but we're going to continue, Mr. Salerno. I apologize at the beginning for not explaining this correctly up front. Um, perhaps I didn't quite pay enough attention to it as a housekeeping item. The town presently practices by having a $1,000 minimum property exemption from personal property taxes for businesses. It is not a thousand dollar tax. It's a thousand dollars worth of property. Uh, the tax, businesses are taxed on their personal property just like their real estate. It's the same rate. But for, if somebody's got a computer and a, and a telephone, the cost of that is, isn't worth administering the cost of, of assessing that personal property tax. So the state statute allows towns to set a minimum property value exemption. The town of Plymouth has been operating with a $1,000 property value extent exemption for years. But in looking, they were unable to find the statutory authority for doing it. So it, they could not find evidence that they adopted this state statute, which allows a town to set a 10,000 up to a $10,000 property value exemption, not the tax. No one would waive a $10,000 tax or even a $1,000 tax. It's the value of the underlying property multiplied by the tax rate. So it's not worth the cost of administering these small items. The town does not intend to change the $1,000 exemption that it's operating under. What it wants to do is have the statutory authority for continuing to do what it already does uh, and avoids the administrative cost of a $6 personal property tax bill that you have to assess the value of um, and may administer it through the office and mail it out and then try to collect it. It's not worth the effort, it's a losing proposition. So they're trying to reach, it. all they want to do is get the statutory authority to do what they've already been doing for years. Further discussion on Article 17? Yes, Mr. Delafield, Lawrence Delafield, Speaking in Article, Article 17. Article Precinct 12. Uh, I don't believe that as written, it's stated as it's intended to state, and I recommend that we, um, that we amend it to state that uh, we are setting a minimum of $1,000 as a body, as I feel we should set up the minimum value. So I would like to make a motion that we, um, we amend it to read that Mr. Delafield, has you, have you reduced your motion to writing? Uh, 
No, I haven't. Can I have your help in putting that in writing? And you have it? Lynn okay. Barrett, Director of Finance, uh, has the text of that motion. Uh, this is a motion to amend by Lawrence Delafield on Article 17. It'll be a majority vote on the motion to amend. The language is to establish a minimum value of $1,000 for personal property assessments. That is the motion to amend. Any further discussion on the motion to amend? Hearing none, I'll call for a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries unanimously. We now have the main motion as amended. Any further discussion on the main motion as amended, which is to establish a minimum value of $1,000 for personal property assessments. Any further discussion? Hearing none, yes. Peter Neville, we're debating the main motion, Article 17, as amended. Uh, Peter Neville, Precinct 10, does this lock in the assessor to uh, sending bills to everyone that has $1,000 worth of personal property? Does, Would does someone it... care to respond to Peter Neville regarding sending bills? Ann Dunn is the Director of Assessing, and she is coming forward to respond to Peter Neville. Yes, that would set the value to be $1,000 for personal property to receive a tax bill. Does it allow you any discretion? No, it has to be an allowable taxable value. I just don't put the $1,000 on it. Okay, I thought there was a uh, question of value of time spent uh, for people that had property values of a thousand to let's say three thousand dollars it wasn't worth collecting it's anything below a thousand dollars that we are asking to be exempt it's below a thousand dollars below a thousand a minimum a floor okay. of a thousand so i guess it begs the question for me is it worth collecting for people that have personal property over a thousand dollars up to five thousand dollars it applies to the people that would pay personal property normally, and the minimum would be less than $1,000. So that anything below $1,000 would be okay. exempt. Okay. Further discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries unanimously. And we now continue in our warrant to Article 29. Mr. McGregor, Planning Board Chair, Malcolm McGregor, moves the town vote to amend its zoning bylaw as most recently amended by amending section 203-16 marijuana establishments by adding the underlying text to the first sentence such that the first sentence as amended shall state marijuana establishments as defined in section 201-3 of the zoning bylaw and medical marijuana treatment centers as defined in chapter 369 of the acts of 2012 and as amended by chapter 55 of the acts of 2017 are allowed by special permit in the light industrial districts. You have the further text. This is a two-thirds vote, and although your packet doesn't state it, it will be a roll call if it's not unanimous. Mr. Salerno. In a vote of 350, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends the town meeting not approve Article 29. The majority of the committee felt the article was too restrictive with respect to the retailer's right to choose their optimal location, effectively diminishing the will of the voters in town meeting. Perversely, this article could force the town to allow retail marijuana shops in industrial areas directly abutting residential neighborhoods. In addition, while the original article sought to limit the number of shops to two, this amendment makes it difficult to discern the ultimate consequences, particularly where it requires an evenly distributed placement even though some industrial zones are entirely unsuited for this activity, such as the nuclear power plant. Those voting in favor felt that this article may help to spread the marijuana shops around town. Wynn Gerhard, Precinct 13. We're debating Article 29. This is a petitioned article, and Wynn Gerhard is the petitioner. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, yes, Wynn Gerhard, Precinct 13. Um, and. Um, I know we went through, just went through an article that's somewhat confusing. This may also be somewhat confusing to people. Um, the um, original petitioned article 
is on page 289 in your book, which is the one that basically says no more than two um, uh, marijuana retailers in um, any one light industrial zone. The uh, article that we're, um, uh, has been moved by the planning board is, the, is in your, um, your book, um, the motion book, on page 17, and it's um, as was just read by the moderator. Um, so we're focusing on the motion that's on page 17, uh, which is rather long, but you can take a look at it. It basically, uh, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of, um, of history. Um, that uh, this addition to the article um, with the petitioners, uh, it was uh, approved by the planning board or passed by the, recommended by the planning board on January 14th. And at that time they said that they felt it was a reasonable step to take to limit the number of marijuana retailers in each light industrial zone. In addition, it will minimize potential traffic impacts of having multiple retailers in each light industrial area of town. They passed it, um, and the select board also voted to support it on January 22nd. Uh, as Mr. Solano said, um, the Administration and Finance Committee did not uh, recommend it. Um, so I just wanted to, now moving to the um, article itself, the amended article, um, I just, it, I know it's somewhat confusing and it's a sort of a large area to deal with, but I just wanted to be clear that what this article, this amended article does not do um, it's not a ban. Uh, there's been some um, materials passed around town that it's a ban on uh, marijuana retailers. I, and I also want to say that I um, am somebody who actually am, supports um, marijuana retailers for the town. I think that it is important to add jobs and economic development and add to our tax base, and it, it can be an important source of revenue. So I personally am not against, um, I, if anybody doesn't, if nobody minds, I'm going to call them pot shops just because it's easier. Uh, uh, I'm not against them. Um, I think that they are impacts that we need to look at, and that's what this um, ended article is about. So, but what the article does not, what it does actually is, back in October of 2017, if people remember, we passed um, the, the bylaw that uh, allowed for the four um, marijuana retailers in the light industrial zones. So this article does not change the fundamental issues in the original and um, the, the article that we passed in October 2017. It doesn't further limit or, or change the major issues, which are that they're only allowed in light industrial zones <clears throat> and only by special permit. Uh, and it doesn't change the number, which is set by state law. It's 20% of the um, liquor licenses, and right, currently that's four. So none of that is changed by this amended article. Um, we, and we're bound by Massachusetts law, which sets other things like buffer zones. Um, I think that, yeah, the maps are starting to go up there. So um, the uh, light industrial zone includes the four, um, the four areas that were mentioned in the amended article. So this one is um, the Industrial Park, Industrial Park Road that's over by Colony Place. Um, this is Summer Street. This is Camelot Park. And this is the uh, nuclear uh, plant. And so those have always, those have been the light industrial zones. So since we passed that law, or that uh, bylaw, all four applicants um, have gone or have looked at and applied for location in the first map, which is the, um, the industrial park. Um, and uh, what's happened is that um, the, there have been four applicants. The town, the select board, has issued um, host agreements to two of them. Um, and there's still um, some issues about the other two. Um, so uh, I think at that time when the planning board issued the second host agreement and there were further applications, the select board actually asked for an opportunity to pause uh, and to think about the impact um, of having all four applicants lined up in this particular one area of town. Um, and I think that that's what generated this, that my thought about this article, uh, because medical, mar I'm sorry, marijuana retailers, pot shops, are not just any kind of business. They're not, you know, sort of your standard industrial park um, tenants. Uh, they're a complex new type of retail of which we have really no experience here in Plymouth. Even the state is just uh, gaining 
um, experience with these unanticipated impacts that, that can come from um, a marijuana retail. Uh, it's almost like it's um, after prohibition ended, and this is kind of like there's a lot of money to be made. Uh, we've seen the history in the industrial park so far is um, in the two that have been approved, one of them was actually, um, n none of them have been approved by the state yet, so they don't have a license to open. They're in the pipeline. The, f one of the, the first one that was approved, which was Triple M, um, was closed at one point by the Department of Public Health because of improper <coughs> use of pesticides. Um, the second one, which was Four Daughters, um, unbeknownst to us, has sold their, um, sold something, sold their right to have a pot shop to uh, an, a chain of some sort. So, as I said, these are unanticipated things that we don't really have a handle on yet. The State Cannabis Commission also has just been issuing guidance on a lot of these unknown issues. But we do know that um, these types of, of shops have to deal in cash. They have drugs on site. Uh, there are potentially a lot of security issues. Um, and that's, again, another one of the concerns. Uh, so, and I think that we've seen other towns. That's where we've had experience in other towns where they open one pot shop. Um, and there's been uh, traffic and uh, congestion and concerns from the neighbors. Um, we're talking about open, opening four in one small area of town. Um, it is a light industrial zone, but it's just one of four. Um, so now we have a chance, and that's what I'm trying to do. We have a chance to pause, I think, and think about some guidance and criteria for how to give these host agreements. They're very valuable business opportunities, obviously. Um, and I think we need to be approached this in a sensible way. Um, so um, the uh, planning board has indicated in their vote that some of the issues to consider would be of, of things like traffic, congestion, uh, the, uh, I would suggest also the level of uh, both existing and planned retail and commercial development in the area. Um, the um, Plymouth Industrial Park has, where the four applicants have, have focused, is actually one of, has more schools in one part of town than almost any other part of Plymouth. There's the Rising Tide School and there's two um, high schools for at-risk youth and there's the Boy and Girls Club. Um, and I think we may disagree on, on marijuana, but I think we're all concerned about proximity to our kids and protecting our kids. And as I say, that particular zone, as opposed to none of the other three areas of the industrial zone have a school within the zone. This area has three. Um, I've, I've talked to the director of the Boys and Girls Club who is very concerned about this. State law allows, requires a 500 foot buffer around schools, but it doesn't protect other areas like the Boys and Girls Club where you have minors um, congregating. Um, so um, I think that when we first, back in October 2017, when we thought about options for medical, um, I keep saying, marijuana retailers in Plymouth, you may remember there was another al uh, alternative um, suggestion to allow them throughout town in retail and commercial areas. Um, and we opted not to do that. We opted to go this route just in the light industrial zone because we were concerned about you know, proximity to retail areas, I'm sorry, residential areas, proximity to schools. We thought the light industrial zones wouldn't, wouldn't have that issue. They wouldn't have proximity to schools. They wouldn't have proximity to, re to residential areas. Um, but in fact, again, the uh, Plymouth Industrial Park, um, where they're all focused right now, is abuts west and north Plymouth, which are the, some of the densest residential parts of town as well. Um, so we do have, uh, there, there are these impacts and burdens, but I also want to emphasize that um, these shops will also bring benefits, like I mentioned, things like jobs, good jobs, uh, economic development, um, and access to, if, for consumers to marijuana. So I think it's, it's something that should even, be evenly distributed around town, both for the, the benefits that we can get, but also for potentially to, to mitigate these impacts. Um, and um, so that was really the, the idea to um, have some criteria and some way to um, have guidance and looking at these, um, these unknown entities, really. Um, we, we've seen what's happened in other towns. We are one of the few towns in the area that is allowing uh, retail marijuana. None of the cities and towns on the Cape are allowing it. 
Uh, Wareham has one. I think Kingston is, almost has one. So from what we've seen in other parts of the state, there's up demand. When ours open in Plymouth, as I say, no one on the Cape will have, have access in their city or in their town. Uh, I think we're going to um, see the negative impacts um, happening. And um, it's the idea is to, to not concentrate them all in one area that has, has schools, traffic already. We all know that area around the industrial park has both Colony Place, Grand Crescent. Um, there is a lot of traffic there in the area. The um, Boston Globe re reported recently that the rate that the State Cannabis Commission is going and approving these is so slow that it's probably gonna take three years to have enough um, retail marijuana shops distributed around the, the Commonwealth so that you won't have this kind of like herd mentality when they open in a particular area. Um, so I guess I just wanted to once again go through these um, just Wynne Gerhard is the petitioner. She has up to 15 minutes. She has about uh, three mi minutes left. And uh, please keep your remarks so that they're not redundant. Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted one last thing, just so you can, again, everything about this is somewhat confusing, but um, the, um, sorry, uh, the, can you get the, yeah. Um, the, Greenish yellow blobs are where there's schools. So you'll see that there's, there's three, the three schools in the industrial park um, in West and North Plymouth. Uh, there's no schools anywhere near Summer Street. Um, and in Camelot Park, the green blob is PCIS. It's across the street. It does extend into the park, but there's obviously a lot of the rest of the park. So I will rest and I just, uh, ask you to think about this as really zoning, but sensible zoning for an, an industry that's somewhat unknown and that we want to get a handle on. Thank you. Steve Lydon. Steve Lydon, Precinct 12. I agree with the FinCom on their, uh, on their position. We talk about there's four in light industrial parks. There really isn't. There's only two. You can't consider Summer Street and you can't consider the nuclear power plant. Uh, we talk about being their schools and security. Um, well, these people are spending thousands of dollars in security to prevent uh, minors from going in and purchasing from their f facilities. Um, if our liquor licenses go up and we have to um, give another marijuana you know, license to someone, I think you're gonna have problems when you try to tell them they have to go to Summer Street and go to the nuclear plant. And all that comes under the um, the ZBA, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and they hear all these cases because they need a special permit and they've been approved by them. And talk about traffic, uh, you look at Colony Place, the wide roads that they have there and different ways you can get in. Talk about Camelot Park, you see what it's like now and it's not gonna get any better. So no one wants to go there because the traffic is so bad. And it's a lot worse than it is up at uh, Exit 7 in Colony Place. So I can't support this amendment, I hope you don't either, thank you. Christopher Favor. Uh, Christopher Favor, uh, West Plymouth. Um, my concern I have with Article 29 is take a look at what the petitioned article reads and take a look at the motion. Now, I have done petitioned articles in the past. And in the past, you know, they don't usually rewrite them. This, now, granted, this, they technically can do this as a zoning article, but it is quite significantly different than what the petitioned article, that the motion actually reads from the petitioned article. What is your point of order? Please stand. I am not a town meeting member, but I am a taxpayer. Uh, Mr. Favor, I did not, was not aware that you were a town, not a town meeting member. I should have called him Brendan Brady. I didn't, you have the floor continue. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So my whole concern that I have is that this new amended motion, whatever you want to call it, mentions Summer Street. Now, Summer Street abuts residents. The other thing that disturbs me is that anytime you make a zoning board or zoning amendment, there's public hearings, there's notification of the butters. I don't believe any of this has happened. 
And that's really disturbing to me. And I can tell you right now, I know people on Sleepy Hollow haven't been notified. I know people on Priest Road haven't been notified. I know people on Crackstone haven't been notified. And I know people on Summer Street and right there at the Federal Furnace. None of them have been notified. And the owner who owns this property is, it's MEZ LLC out of Brookline, Mass. That's all I can find. I don't know who that is, but I don't know how this even came about. But if you look at the original petitioned article, it never, ever, ever said Summer Street at all in the whole piece. And now this is in the amended piece. I find that disturbing, and I ask you to vote no on this. Thank you. Brendan Brady. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Brendan Brady, Precinct 10. Uh, when I think all the points that you raised are valid, I think that this article is not the solution, though. You use the term sensible zoning right at the end of your speech. By restricting marijuana retailers to just the industrial parks, we've created this problem. We have several boards responsible for issuing these permits, and we have businesses fleeing the shops at five right next to industrial, zoned as commercial. I think in the fall, what we need to do is expand the allowable areas to commercial so that we can make better access to available space for these retailers and not restrict it all into these industrial parks. The solution is actually expanding into commercial and not restricting to industrial. No, Thank you've you, had a chance to speak. Um, please come forward. Thank you. Um, Denise McFallon, I'm a resident, not a town meeting member. Um, I just ask that you vote no on this, not because I'm not for sensible zoning, because there are quite a bit of unknowns. The law is still worked on. It's not even set in stone yet. They vote on the law every day. Um, you can go on the Cannabis Control Commission website and see the difference every Thursday they post um, a new law, a new regulation. Um, with all due respect, uh, Mashpee, Barnstable, and all of the Lower Cape are allowing recreational marijuana. Sandwich, Falmouth are allowing medical marijuana. So there are marijuana pot shops that are going to be in the vicinity of this area. It's not just going to be Plymouth and nowhere else. Um, also, I feel that before town meeting votes on anything, either this meeting or in the fall, that you strongly consider an ad hoc committee to look at how the law is changing constantly um, and do sensible zoning by educating. Right now, I don't feel like anybody is educated on this. You can't be. No one can possibly be educated on something that is constantly moving and changing. Thank you. Amy Hine. Amy Hine, Precinct 14. Um, so it was said that the selectmen are in support. I would like to hear from them. Anyone care to speak on behalf of the Board of Selectmen regarding Article 29? Kenneth Tavares is chair of the Board of Selectmen. Mr. Tavares. The, the decision by the board was based on the fact that uh, one area was being concentrated and we thought that it should be spread out. That it's pure and simple. It was just that so many of them were going into one area. So it, uh, and I do agree with the last speaker. This is changing. And I, I must uh, say that I think we're going to be back here many, many more times in the next couple of years trying to figure out exactly what the state has handed us. Wynne Gearhard. I think we have a motion. Mr. Howe. Ken Howe, I move the question. Moves to close debate. Uh, first, anyone standing who still wishes to be heard? I believe we have one person standing. And uh, now we'll take a vote on whether to close debate. It's a two-thirds vote. I will first take it orally. All those in favor of closing debate say aye. Opposed say no. no. It carries by two thirds. We have now closed debate. We will now vote on the main motion under Article 29. It does require a two thirds vote and a roll call if it is not unanimous. And we are going to go right to the electronic voting on this article since I do not expect it to be unanimous. 
So when the light goes on, <coughs> you will be ready and you will vote on Article 29. The green light is on. You have your 20 seconds. We have 135 elected town meeting members. You're voting on the main motion as printed in your motion packet. You have 10 more seconds in which to vote. We have over 100 members voting. This is a vote to approve a zoning bylaw change. It is a two-thirds vote. We need two-thirds in which to pass. We are now looking. It has failed. 22 voting in favor, 83 in opposition, and three abstentions. And you see as we scroll through, it will indicate whether your vote was properly recorded. We have precinct seven, eight, and nine, and now we have 11, 10, 10, 11, and 12, and finally 13, 14, and 15. Article 30, I have no motion. Hearing no motion, I declare no action. Article 31, I have no motion. Hearing no motion, I declare no action. Article 32, Mr. Slurna moves the town vote to amend the, zone, the town general bylaw, wetlands protection, chapter 196, section 196-5, A, adoption of regulations and fee schedule to add a sentence to the end paragraph A that says, these rules, regulations, design specification, and policy guidelines or amendments adopted by the commission must be approved by a voted town meeting. It's a majority vote, a roll call if it's not unanimous. Mr. Salerno. In a vote of 7-3-2, the Advisory and Finance Committee recommends that town meeting approve Article 32. Town meeting approval of this article will amend the general bylaw to require a vote of town meeting to adopt rules, regulations, design specifications, and policy guidelines or amendments of the Conservation Commission. Those voting against while recognizing the reality that Conservation Commission rules could be construed as de facto land use regulations, felt that the wording of the article was too broad, didn't delineate which types of regulations should be subject to town meeting, and potentially affected even routine housekeeping rules that every other committee can set for themselves. Thank you. Uh, Mary Ellen Parker. This is Article 32. It is a petitioned article. Mary Ellen Parker speaking. Thank you and welcome. Mary Ellen Parker, Precinct 7. Uh, <clears throat> for reference, this is a summary on page 305 of the FinCon report. The article simply proposes to reinstate in, into the bylaw a sentence originally included. It says, these rules, regulations, design specifications and policy guidelines or amendments adopted by the commission must be approved by a vote of town meeting. There was no objection at the time of sentence removal, believing if it did not work out, we could change it back. In the long run, it has not worked out. No touch and no build buffers have been created that are more onerous than the resource areas they adjoin. At first, waivers were negotiated, buffer policies made the process predictable and reliable. Nowadays, there is no firm policy other than the regulations mean what they say. No touch means no touch and no build means no build, period. It is unreasonable and does little to nothing to protect wetlands. For example, stone steps from a deck to beach stairs across lawn to avoid trampling could not be had. The stepping stones do not interfere with performance standards for a coastal bank. They do not destabilize the bluff or interfere with sediment supply. This amendment is a ratification clause intending a check for balance. Presently, there is none. It is for our legislature to take a common sense look 
at what the Commission proposes. No specific case or appeal comes before town meeting, only those items stating, stated in the amendment. Should any future debate become too strenuous, it is a simple matter to move the question, though town meeting approval is likely to become a simple house, housekeeping item in the future. A serious issue with present procedures is the Commission's practice of establishing rules, regulations, or policies effective immediately. Just last Tuesday, new rules were put to a vote, effective immediately. The vote lost on a three to three tie, but had they passed, scores of plans and applications would have been affected. Policies are treated the same way, effective immediately when a 30-day lead time is necessary to include changes in filings without reworking <clears throat> pending applications. There are emergency procedures when expedition is necessary. It has taken many years to develop local bylaw with rules and regulations. The bylaw amendment does not interfere with commission ability to respond to pressing issues. The amendment guarantees needed sufficient notice not presently provided. With 737 miles of coastline, a pond for every day of the year, and numerous rivers and swamps, a great many of us are affected directly or indirectly by wetland regulations. This amendment gives us the ability to sit down with the commission before town meeting and argue successfully for rules and regulations that technically satisfy wetland performance standards without introducing capricious, arbitrary, or authoritarian language. 30 seconds. When, when wetland protections first came into being, they were governed by the Department of Environmental Quality Engineering, the DEQE, not the DEP. It was about conservation, not preservation. There are many avenues to legitimately achieve preservation, but not on the backs of homeowners. It is a systematic issue. Leave any group alone. With time enough to expand their passion, they will do so. You need additional time. Ms. Parker. 30 seconds. So no objection, please continue. We encourage town meeting to amend the bylaw and ensure our rules and regulations are fair and reasonable. Thank you for your time and consideration. And if Mr. Stephen Bjorkland could have permission to speak, it would be very helpful. Thank you. I don't see any other town meeting members rising to speak. Is there another? No, I do have town meeting members first, I'm sorry. Under our rules, we must call the town meeting members first. Uh, Ms. King Fisher, if you wish to speak, followed yes. by Edward Russell. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I just have a question that I would like to put to a member of our um, staff, perhaps, or the select board, which is that um, my question is that are there any other boards, commissions, or committees which currently um, have bylaw direction and thus take that direction and go through the public process of developing their own, the rules and the regulations for that um, board, commission, or committee. Uh, are there any others that would have to come back to town meeting for approval of those rules or regulations such as I think this, this um, article is going to suggest happen? Anyone care to respond? Lee Hartman is our Director of Planning and Development. Welcome, Mr. Hartman. Thank you. There are the Conservation Commission, Planning Board, Board of Health, Zoning Board of Appeals, and the Historic District Commission. And I also would point out that I, I think it was kind of mentioned, a public hearing is required for any one of those boards to change their regulations. But we have several boards uh, with regulations. Some of them are as complex as the Conservation Commission. Thank you. Knowing that, um, I am going to vote no on this article because I don't believe that we will have the scientific and technical knowledge 
um, as a body to really understand the complexities of these rules and regulations. Thank you. Actually, you're going to go to Karen Edwards first, Precinct 1, followed by Ed Russell. Hi. Um, my name is Karen Edwards. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 1, and I've also been on the Conservation Commission for over four years now. And I just wanted to read a short passage here. Conservation commissions were created to administer the Wetlands Protection Act. That's a general, Massachusetts General Law 40. And Plymouth has also adopted their own bylaw, Chapter 196. Any decisions made by the commissioners can be, can be appealed to the DEP. So if a homeowner is unhappy with not accepting a permit, they certainly can go to DEP. And then beyond that, they can also um, take it um, to court. And that's because, you know, it's not right for a homeowner to be at the mercy of just one local body. And that's why they do have those checks and balances and they can do that. And also, um, it's been, it's been listed that there are only four conservation commissioners. There are seven conservation commissioners. And also, the longest standing member currently has been a member of the commission for over 15 years, and the newest member has been on the commission for three years. So I'm kind of just explaining some misnomers on some of those um, on Article 32. And I wanted to point out the difference between a bylaw which does have to go to us, the town meeting members, and regulations. And I have information, Mr. Hartman, that no other committee or town board has, to, has needs town meeting approval for regulations. And I thought I just heard you say that they do, that there are other boards that have to come to town meeting for regulations. So, um, you know, rules and regulations are developed by every committee, so in order for them to continue uh, doing business. The other thing, too, is what we do is we implement, we are actually have the authority from the state to implement the, wet, the State Wetlands Protection Act and also to implement this Plymouth Wetland Protection Act. And what we do is we protect the resource areas, uh, by filtering and removing pollutants, by pre providing gr uh, groundwater recharge, maintaining surface and groundwater flows, moderating water temperatures, providing essential habitat for wet, um, wetland wildlife and plant species, and preventing and, or reducing erosion and siltation into the wetlands, and by protecting our water quality. So activities undertaken in the buffer zone um, has a very high likelihood of adverse impact to any resource area. And we have so many lakes in, in Plymouth, as you know, and so many older homes that are already been there for decades. So when a, a homeowner <laughs> wants to come and perhaps expand their home and there's no place else to go but closer to the lake or the pond, they have to come in front of us and prove that their expansion or their is not going to um, affect the, in, the, the, the wetland, actually. Um, let's see. What else? Oh, a couple of other questions that came up while I was doing the caucuses and also from FinCom. So um, um, we, do, we do issue waivers. When a homeowner comes, it's up to them as the applicant to prove that there are no other alternatives for them to place their septic tank, for them to, you know, add stairs as an exit, for instance, and there's no other alternatives. So they have to prove that, and if they do prove that there's no other alternative, we do issue a waiver, and yes, we do allow them to continue to do their project within the buffer zones. Um, what else? Um, we also um, have- 30 a, seconds. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, extensive, 
extensive education workshops are given by the Massachusetts um, Association of Conservation Commissioners. Usually takes three years to go through all those classes. Rich Vaca is our conservation planner. He has a legal degree. He has many, many other kinds of degrees and many, many years of conservation. He is our agent director. We also have circuit riders. Those are folks that go around the southeast region. And if we have questions, they help us out. Thank you. So, thanks a lot for listening. Edward Russell, followed by Richard Serkey, Mr. Russell. Ed Russell, Precinct 12. Uh, Plymouth faces waves of development, and we have waves of people that want to impinge on our wetlands. Uh, these waves require the flexibility that we have now, and I plan to vote against this article. Richard Serkey, followed by William Abbott. Mr. Serkey, on the motion. I heard it said a moment ago that a dissatisfied applicant can appeal to the DEP. That's not correct if the reason for the dissatisfaction is the application of the wetlands bylaw or the rules and regulations under the wetlands bylaw. If your project is turned down under the bylaw or under the rules and regulations, your only appeal is to the court. Uh, the only appeal is to the court under the certiorari statute. The second issue that I want to mention is the fact that um, bylaws generally are the province of town meeting. Regulations under the bylaws of the various municipal bodies that we have are usually procedural in nature. The regulations here for the Conservation Commission are more than procedural in nature, they're substantive in nature. And there's a point at which a regulation that's substantive in nature really is a bylaw masquerading as a regulation. And when a regulation is substantive, I think it's a bylaw, and I think it needs to come before the town. Uh, otherwise, basically we see a a conservation commission that has the potential to enact policies that otherwise would be bylaws and would have to come before the town, but because they're called rules and regulations, they can do them on their own. So I support Mr. Salerno's motion <clears throat> to, uh, in, to vote in favor of this article. William Abbott. <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, I hope we defeat this article with a, with a very large no it seems obvious the intent of the article is to weaken the Conservation Commission. When it, and we heard, you know, 10 minutes here of various ways they think the Conservation Commission is, is being too, uh, too tough. If anything, with, what, with the onslaught, certainly the part of the town of our precinct and that part of town which is coming with the development, the, the hundreds and hundreds of units, we don't need to relax the restrictions with respect to pond shore development and ocean shore development. We need the Conservation Commission carrying out the bylaw seamlessly with the Wetlands Act at the state level. They always do the two together. It works well. We've had many, many cases. We always they dealt with at the same time. It would be a total muddle for this town meeting to get involved to try to write the regulations for the Conservation Commission. I hope you vote no. Betsy Hall. Betsy Hall, Precinct 12. Um, I am uh, hoping that you will vote no on this um, article because we just voted an article to protect our water. We just voted to uh, create a water protection district for our drinking water. And the Conservation Commission, because of the number of ponds and lakes and rivers and streams throughout our town, when they protect a lake, a pond, a river, then um, they're protecting our drinking water. And I live on a pond, I've lived on a pond for 20 years, and I have never found it onerous to protect my pond. In fact, we pump our septic way up from where our house is on the pond, way up to almost to the road, which is like 500 feet. And we do that with two pumps, and it costs a lot of money, but we're glad to do that. The Conservation Commission asked us to do that when we bought our house. So that was to protect the pond, to protect our drinking water, and also to protect the drinking water of all the people who live around us. So I think that anything that weakens our Conservation Commission weakens the protection for our water supply, our drinking water. So I ask you, please vote against this. Daniel Gorsica, we're debating Article 32. Dan Gorska, Precinct 13. So 
<clears throat> this proposed change that I'm in support of, we're not technically affecting the regulation. What we're saying is we want to be made aware of what the changes are and have the right to vote. And I just want to say, if we can vote a $230 million budget, then we are more than qualified to vote on Wetland Protections Act or other regulations that the Conservation Commission would like to enforce. Thank you. Patricia McCarthy, Precinct 5. I move the question. Motion to close debate. Do we have anybody else standing? <laughs> Cares to be heard? This is not debatable. And at this time, I will do a voice vote as to whether to close debate. All those in favor of closing debate say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The motion carries. We have now closed debate on Article 32. It's a majority vote, a roll call if it is not unanimous. Um, I will first, no, I will go right to the roll call. I think we have enough division here. So get ready to vote, and when the light goes on, you will vote on Article 32, the motion that's before you. We're waiting for the light to come on. You'll have 20 seconds in which to vote. And town meeting members can begin voting now. 135 town meeting members voting on Article 32. It is a majority vote on this article. And we're doing our roll call now. We have over 100 town meeting members who are voting on Article 32. And as we count down the seconds, we see 106 have voted. And we now have the completion of the voting. It fails and 38 voting in favor, 66 in opposition, two abstentions. We'll scroll through. At this time, I call upon Kenneth Tavares, and he is chair of the Board of Selectmen. Mr. Tavares. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, in view of the hour, I'll be very quick. Uh, I would first like to say thank you to the Finance Committee for hours and hours of work. And And at this town meeting, we should take special note that the chairman is retiring from his job at the podium. <laughs> I hope we see him back, but he's done an excellent job and served this town well. Thank you, Harry. <laughs> to the moderator and the town staff, thank you. And to each and every one of you as town meeting members, thank you for the hours that you have put in. We realize that this is strenuous. You've done it, and you've done it well. Thank you. Kevin Canty, Vice Chair, Advisory and Finance. And while Mr. Canty is coming up, I'd like to thank Mr. Pizer and Pearl Sears from the Clerk's Office. I'd like to thank the Assistant Moderators, Nicole Manfredi, uh, Brian Alosi. Special thanks to Jeanette White, who works closely with me as Administrative Support. Kevin Canty. Thank you town meeting. In light of the hour, I will keep my comments brief, but I did want to take a moment, just as Ken Tavares just did, to thank Harry Salerno for his service to the town. He's been on the committee longer than I have, and it has been an honor to serve with him over these years. I'd like to specifically, I think the town owes him a tremendous amount of thanks for all the work he's done, specifically call out two aspects that I think we should all be grateful for. The first is the large volume of work that the chairman of the Advisory and Finance Committee has to do in order to put town meeting together, make the report and recommendations, and do all of it for zero dollars. And we are very thankful of the effort that you've put in. I would also like to thank, more personally, I had the opportunity a few years ago to run in an election with Harry Salerno. We were running against each other. Luckily for the Advisory and Finance Committee, neither of us won. <laughs> But whether I was running against him or sitting next to him, whether we were on the same side of an issue or whether we disagreed, Harry Salerno has always conducted himself with the utmost respect for everyone. He has always been kind to those around him. And his first and foremost concern has always been making sure that this town runs better and serves the citizens as well as it should. And we are all better for his efforts, and I thank him very much. Thank you. Thank you. Harry Salerno, Chair, Advisory and Finance Committee. Thank you. It's a rare moment of speechlessness for me. <laughs> I'm afraid you've, you've got me blushing. Thank you all. Um, all I'll say is I want to thank the Finance Committee for all their work 
and Jeanette White especially, and the entire staff at Town Hall um, for everything, getting everything done. They, made, they just made me look good. I want to thank you all for honoring me with this responsibility. I will always cherish the respect you've shown me. Thank you. Article 33, I have no motion. Hearing no motion, I declare no action. Mr. Salerno, your final motion? We move to dissolve the meeting. Mr. Salerno moves to dissolve the town meeting. Any discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Motion carries. This town meeting is dissolved at 9.55. Thank you.